I'd like to welcome you all to PD Rhythm 10. This is the pre-conference seminar for fellows and associated professionals. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this session as, as well as the rest of the meeting. But what we're going to focus on today are the basics of electrophysiology, beginning with the electrocardiogram. And what I've done is put together uh, 10 important patterns to recognize uh, when you're uh, reviewing electrocardiograms. These are things that could impact on a patient's safety and life and are uh, findings that you just cannot miss. Uh, top of the list, number one, long QT syndrome. I think we all know the accepted definitions of this. Um, it's a QTC greater than 450 in a male or greater than 460 in a female without identifiable cause. And that qualifier at the end, identifiable cause is important because history uh, is critical when you're evaluating QT intervals. You need to know if the patient's on a medication that could be affecting repolarization, whether they have uh, electrolyte disturbances, whether they have other cardiac comorbidity that could affect uh, the QT and the T wave. Um, so it's important to know what you're dealing with uh, when you are evaluating the QT interval. Another caveat is don't always trust the machine calculation. It's pretty good, but I've seen it be off by more than 20 milliseconds in probably about 10% of the tracings that I read. And it's important that you do a manual correction when the stakes are high. And then finally, uh, you sort of get used to, after a while to what a normal T wave looks like and uh, you begin to spot uh, atypical features that reinforce a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. For example, in LQT type one, which is a potassium channel defect, the T wave tends to have a very broad base. In LQT type two, another potassium channel defect, the T wave tends to be low amplitude with bumps and notches. And in LQT type three, there's a long flat ST segment with a terminal T wave that is late and very uh, pointed. Now these are not absolute. There's no substitute for proper genotyping uh, when a question arises, um, but it is useful to recognize that true long QT syndrome will have some T wave abnormalities that, that can be helpful in the diagnosis. So let me start with a rather dramatic case and family history. Um, this is a young lady who I have followed for decades. Uh, she's been a very difficult case to manage. She was born with congenital deafness and uh, a very long uh, corrected QT interval over 500 milliseconds. This is what we used to refer to as gervell lang nelson syndrome with the congenital deafness. Um, but in her particular case, she's required lots of medications, uh, sympathectomy, and ICD placement. On her halter monitor, she has another telltale sign. Uh, this top strip here shows the narrow QRS, but very bizarre T wave behavior with an axis for the T wave that alternates. So this T wave alternans um, is a a uh, marker of high risk and long QT syndrome. And below is a printout from her ICD, which shows uh, an episode of Torsad um, that was appropriately terminated um, by her device. Um, fortunately, now we have her stable, but uh, to keep her there is requiring a lot of work. This is her sister's electrocardiogram. Um, her sister has normal hearing, is asymptomatic, but has a long corrected QT interval of 485 milliseconds. One could argue that that T wave is kind of broad based, maybe reminiscent of LQT type 1. Here's her other sister, a little less dramatic, corrected QT interval of 475 milliseconds, normal hearing, asymptomatic. And she has a third sister who's got a normal electrocardiogram and is asymptomatic. 
So this is the breakdown of the family. Uh, it turns out both the mother and the father are heterozygotes for LQT type 1. Different mutations, but the same defect. And uh, the index case that I showed you has uh, inherited both of the mutations. So she is a double dose of LQT1, if you will. The first sister that I showed you, she's a heterozygote, um, is doing very well on beta blocker, as is sister number two, um, a heterozygote for the other mutation. And sister number three, fortunately, did not inherit either of the mutations, and she's perfectly normal. So um, a sort of a classic genetics breakdown in this one family. But it also uh, demonstrates the um, additive uh, problem that occurs with uh, two different mutations in the same person. This is an example of the electrocardiogram from a patient with uh, genotype positive LQT type 2. Uh, it shows the classic low amplitude T wave with the humps and the bumps and the uh, corrected QT interval over 500 milliseconds. Um, this patient uh, presented with a recurrent syncope. And finally, uh, this is a genotype positive case of LQT type 3, asymptomatic thus far, but a concerning family history. And in this particular case, there is the characteristic, you can see it well in leads 1 and 2, a long, flat ST segment followed by uh, a peaking late T wave. Now, those three disorders, LQT 1, 2, and 3, will count for about 90% or more of patients with long QT syndrome. But they're not the only forms of repolarization abnormality. I think it's also important that you know about these, anderson towel syndrome and Timothy syndrome, sometimes referred to as LQT7 and LQT8. It's probably better to use their syndrome names. It makes it a little bit easier uh, to keep the phenotype in your mind. But this is anderson towel syndrome. Um, the QT interval, depends upon how you measure it, it may be 475 milliseconds, but could be longer if you start to include that very late repolarization that you see in the right precordium there. I'm not sure if that's a U wave or a T wave, but it's definitely abnormal. And the thing that really cinches the diagnosis in this case is the fact that um, this young lady has um, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia quite frequently with an appearance that's sort of bi-directional, which is classic for anderson towel syndrome. Um, other characteristic phenotypic features, um, which were present in, in this young lady's family, um, would be uh, periodic paralysis of skeletal muscle, which can be quite severe and debilitating and very distinctive uh, facial features. Another uh, syndrome of importance, fortunately it's rare, but it's bad when it happens, even with aggressive treatment, the mortality rate is very high, but it's Timothy syndrome, uh, so-called LQT type eight. These patients have a very long corrected QT interval, uh, also severe hypoglycemia at birth, syndactyly, as you see in the uh, hand x-rays there, sometimes pulmonary hypertension and developmental delay. Fortunately, it's rare, but it, it's a tough problem. And finally, there are some very rare repolarization abnormalities, <clears throat> which uh, can involve uh, calmodulin genes. Um, this is an example of a patient who I knew had a prolonged repolarization with uh, corrected QT intervals near 500, but a flip T wave. And I never knew what that was about. In the early days of genotyping, we tested her for LQT type 1, 2, and 3, which are the only tests available, and she was negative. Um, but she had uh, symptomatic arrhythmias and ended up getting an ICD that she's used appropriately. <clears throat> 
Um, I never had a good label for it, but uh, one of my partners, Dominic Abrams, um, said, you know, that flip T wave, that goes along with cow modulin problems. Why don't you test her for that? And um, fortunately, uh, uh, genotyping had gotten more sophisticated. And when we did test, um, Dr. Abrams was absolutely correct. This was a cow modulinopathy. At the other end of the spectrum is short QT syndrome, which is defined as a corrected QT interval less than 340 milliseconds. These patients are subject to VTVF as well as atrial fibrillation. Fortunately, it's a very, very rare problem, but the EKG um, is quite distinctive, uh, as you can see in this example here, where the corrected QT interval was only 316 milliseconds. And it's really quite a distinctive abnormality that you, you spot quite quickly once you're used to looking at uh, lots and lots of electrocardiograms. Moving on to something a little more common, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Uh, I just want to make the point that you could miss a delta wave on an electrocardiogram unless you look at all the leads. You need a full 12 lead or 15 lead electrocardiogram in order to make sure you don't miss this. There is a differential diagnosis for WPW syndrome, um, which includes something called a fasciculoventricular fiber. We don't have time to go into that today. Um, but there's also some pseudo preexcitation patterns that you can see in single ventricle patients and hypertrophic myopathy um, with that mimics WPW, but it's not the real McCoy. Well, look at this electrocardiogram. This is a patient who has a history of recurrent SVT. So you're immediately going to be suspicious of preexcitation. But if you just looked at lead one, um, it wouldn't strike you that there's anything amiss. However, if you look at the lateral precordial leads, you can see there's pretty obviously a delta wave there. And in fact, this was a, a Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, no ifs, ands, or buts. So, based on the electrocardiographic pattern, um, you can sometimes get an inkling where the pathway is located. And there's different algorithms for this purpose. This is a simplified version of the Aruda algorithm that I'd like to teach our fellows. Um, it's quick and simple, uh, but the first step would be to look at lead one, and if there's a, a isoelectric um, area there, um, it puts you in a left free wall location. So down below here, when this patient came for their ablation procedure, it's an LAO view, that shows you the mitral annulus right here. Here's the coronary sinus. And the red dots are the site where we ablated this pathway that was, in fact, left free wall. This example is much more obvious. Um, in this particular case, using that same simplified algorithm, um, it would put the accessory pathway likely to be in a septal location. Um, and in fact, uh, that's where it was at the ablation procedure. Once again, the LAO view, here's coronary sinus, here's septum. The yellow dot marks the his bundle location. And this was a mid-septal accessory pathway. Uh, a little bit tricky to ablate, but fortunately, the procedure went well. Less common, <clears throat> um, but still important, Brugada syndrome. Now, this is usually thought of as an adult disease. But we have seen some pretty dramatic cases in younger patients. Um, this is a presentation of a 20-month-old who came to the emergency room with a protracted febrile illness. And while being positioned for a lumbar puncture, went into rapid VT and arrested. After resuscitation and after fever control, this is what the electrocardiogram looked like. And it's obviously abnormal, um, sort of looks a little bit like right bundle branch block, but in fact, what this really is, is an elevated ST segment and a T wave that dips down beneath the isoelectric baseline. And if you don't believe me, it becomes even more dramatic when the patient spiked the fever again, 
and this is what the electrocardiogram looks like. Um, the, you know, the QRS stopped around here. This is all less T-segment elevation, and that's just a deep diving uh, T-wave beneath the baseline. So the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome depends upon that kind of pattern, the so-called type 1 pattern, um, also referred to as the coved pattern uh, with ST segment elevation and a T wave that dips down beneath the baseline. The elevation has to be at least 2 millimeters. Usually it's more than that. Um, but when you see that type of pattern, um, you put it in uh, the clinical perspective, and you can make the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. There's a type 2 and type 3 Brugada pattern talked about as well, so-called saddleback shape. Um, they're not diagnostic, but you can see in the same patient, sometimes their electrocardiograms gets somewhat normalized, and they can have that type of appearance um, in lead V1 and V2. This is another patient with a dramatic diagnostic electrocardiogram. The ST segment is very elevated here in lead V1. The T wave dives deep beneath the isoelectric baseline. And this was a patient who presented at age two and a half years with sustained monomorphic VT. Fortunately, didn't arrest, but uh, the diagnosis was eventually made of Brugada syndrome and treated accordingly. Um, What's interesting is this is his sister during family screening. This is his younger sister. This is what her EKG looked like. It, it, you know, the T wave is negative in V1, but it's supposed to be in, in children and in young children. So it doesn't really help, but there was a, a lot of suspicion because of the family history. So a provocative challenge of procaine amide was, was performed. And in fact, you can see the uh, type 1 Brugada pattern evolves when the patient is exposed to procaine amide. And um, both the index case and the sister um, uh, proved to be uh, genotype positive. Number five on the list, superior axis. And by superior, I mean less than minus 30 degrees in a young patient. And the possible diagnoses are some form of AV canal defect or a tricuspid atresia in a cyanotic newborn. But this is a 14-year-old soccer player presented to our emergency room with SVT. It's a narrow complex SVT um, that was uh, appropriately and promptly treated with uh, adenosine. And if you'll notice, the QRS during the SVT has a superior axis, and that persisted after conversion back to sinus rhythm. So you got to ask yourself, why is the axis way up in the air like that? And in fact, when you examine this young man, he had a fixed split second heart sound. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts. So he had a prima ASD. Just based on that, you could make the diagnosis. We confirmed it by echo, but there was really not much of a need to. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he had a, a defect that would need surgery. We had to get rid of his SVT before he went to the operating room. And that's why this was important, because it turned out he had AV node reentry. And the AV node location in a patient with any type of canal defect is abnormal. So what usually is a pretty simple, prompt procedure uh, was quite tedious in this young man. Uh, but fortunately, things went well. We got rid of his SVT, closed his ASD, and he's back out on the soccer field. Number six on the list, arrhythmogenic dysplasia, um, which we usually think of as involving the right ventricle but it can involve uh, both ventricles. The EKG features are negative T waves that extend way out in the precordium. It's common to see negative T waves in young patients uh, out to V2, sometimes to V3, but you shouldn't see it in V4, 5, and 6. Um, something's up if you see it that far laterally. Uh, the other EKG feature is a right ventricular conduction disturbance, and occasionally, you see something called an epsilon wave in V1. 
So this is an interesting case. This is a young woman, college student, who had an ASD closure at our hospital um, two years prior to this event. Uh, when she presented to uh, a local emergency room and sustained tachycardia that turns out it's ventricular tachycardia. Now, patients who have had an ASD repair don't get VT. Uh, something's going on here. Um, her ASD had not been that large. It was maybe moderate in size, but her RV was enlarged. She had an RV volume load, um, so that's why she was uh, sent to the operating room. Um, but this shouldn't be happening. So there's something else going on. So here's her EKG um, afterwards. I mean, this is not an immediately post-VT event. Um, this is sometime after. And you can see she has T waves that are inverted all the way out to V7. She also has a bit of a right ventricular conduction delay. And it turned out she had arrhythmogenic dysplasia. The RV was big, maybe a little bit because of the ASD, but probably more so because of the uh, right ventricular dysplasia and expansion. So um, she got an ICD and she also underwent uh, ablation successfully. Uh, and during that ablation procedure for VT, uh, we noted low voltage throughout her uh, right ventricle. Uh, we were able to ablate um, one VT in her, but um, she is at risk for others in the future with this disease. Here's another young man. <clears throat> he was the goalie on his um, school lacrosse team, was wearing a chest protector, but got hit in the chest with a, a lacrosse ball and arrested. Fortunately, the coach knew CPR and uh, uh, was able to uh, maintain good perfusion until the EMTs got there um, and shocked them back to sinus rhythm. Uh, this is his electrocardiogram when he arrived at our hospital. His uh, RV was um, somewhat dilated uh, on echocardiogram, although some people were dismissing it as post-resuscitation. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. Um, he had an enlarged right ventricle and he's got T waves that are flipped out to V5. And I was quite suspicious of arrhythmogenic dysplasia. And in fact, if you look uh, at lead V1 in more detail, that QRS has a little terminal sharp spike. And that is a so-called epsilon wave. Um, we were able to make the diagnosis of uh, arrhythmogenic dysplasia in him. He also uh, underwent ICD placement and also had successful ablation um, for two VT circuits at least so far, two VT circuits. He could get more in the future. Uh, but an interesting thing is there there was a uh, retrograde family diagnosis made in this case on, on questioning. It turns out his father was being treated by uh, an adult electrophysiology group in town for uh, idiopathic ventricular tachycardia. And I called them up and I said, you know, we just diagnosed this young man with arrhythmogenic dysplasia and you care for his father have you, have you thought about that? And they said, well, we don't think it's that. Well, it turned out it was. And, um, you know, he's, he's uh, being treated accordingly. Uh, both the patient and his dad are doing fine. Hypertrophic myopathy can have a lot of different EKG appearances. Um, some of the common ones, but not exclusive, uh, would be left axis deviation, uh, again, inverted T waves, um, and I will say, watch the calibration mark on every electrocardiogram that you uh, are handed. Um, sometimes there's a bit of a surprise. Um, hypertrophic myopathy does not necessarily have classic voltage criteria for LVH, but the EKG is always um, abnormal. So this was a 15-year-old asymptomatic young man who had new murmur on routine physical exam by his primary care provider and was sent in to us. And I looked at the electrocardiogram and I said, well, something's not right here. Look at his T waves, they're inverted. Um, there's left axis deviation. And um, the technician was trying to do me a favor here and ran the paper at, uh, at, at half standard 
so there wouldn't be a lot of overlap. But um, if, if you're not paying attention to that, this is full standard, and you can see the voltage criteria for LVH are easily met. Um, so pay attention to calibration mark, it matters. This is another patient with hypertrophic myopathy, and I don't know why his electrocardiogram looks like this. Um, he's got a very thick septum, but hardly any left lateral voltages on electrocardiogram. So this can look like a lot of things, but um, rarely, if ever, is the EKG completely normal. Number eight on our list, uh, unexplained bundle branch block. I don't ever consider this normal. Um, particularly left bundle branch block. That, that's never benign. Um, but right bundle branch block is also concerning for some subtle diseases, um, one of them being Kern-Sayre syndrome, which I'll say more about in a minute. And you have to spot that because that can progress very rapidly to complete heart block. Uh, there are familial conduction system diseases. They're rare. Uh, it can be a post-myocarditis phenomenon or it can be a manifestation of arrhythmogenic dysplasia. Um, but the one I don't want you to ever miss is kern sayre syndrome. Uh, the telltale um, physical exam finding uh, is ptosis of the eyelids and restricted extraocular motion. This is a mitochondrial disease that affects muscle. It's many different levels, um, but the, uh, the eye findings are, are very characteristic. And if you see that with somebody who's got right bundle branch block, um, you better act quickly to, to consider pacing in their case. Getting down to the end, number nine, Alcapa, uh, anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery um, causing uh, left ventricular ischemia. Um, usually an infant presentation, not exclusively, but usually a sick infant at presentation, but the EKG can give you a very good clue of what's going on. There tends to be um, deep Q waves um, in, in uh, the left chest leads. Uh, there can be variable ST elevation. There can be variable loss of R wave voltages. Um, this is a pretty classic electrocardiogram for that condition. Uh, here's an even more severe case. Um, this child was so unstable, had to go on ECMO before going to the operating room. Uh, but in this case, the ischemia is much more pronounced, has the so-called tombstone pattern uh, of ST elevation out here in V5 and, and V6. And the reason I show this, what's amazing is after this child had successful surgery, there's the electrocardiogram two months post-op. It's practically normal. I mean, the T waves are a little flat, okay, but, um, you know, the the... Q, there's no Q wave, there's uh, normal precordial voltages um, in this infant, and um, it's amazing how resilient some children can be. Finally, uh, electrolyte abnormalities. Sodium, it doesn't do too much to the electrocardiogram. If you're hypernatremic, you can get increased atrial and junctional ectopy. Um, but otherwise, the EKG is pretty normal. You can be severely hyponatremic, and it has a minimal, if any, EKG effects. In comparison, potassium abnormalities affect the EKG a lot. If you're hypokalemic, the T waves tend to get flat, the QTC gets prolonged, and you're subject to uh, VT and VF. If you're hyperkalemic, I'm going to show you an example in a minute of what that EKG looks like. Calcium, um, if you're hypocalcemic, the QTC can be prolonged. If you're hypercalcemic, uh, the QTC can be shortened. Sometimes it gets so short that you can get some confusing ST elevation, but that's quite rare. But this is a good example of hyperkalemia. Um, this is a 13-year-old renal transplant patient. Uh, we were called to see because of, quote, ventricular tachycardia, unquote. And the patient was hemodynamically stable, but this is what the EKG looked like. And uh, the people caring for this patient wanted us to get him out of uh, VT. And I said, well, what's the potassium? And they said, well, we just checked it a little while ago and it was, it was fine. And I said, well, why don't you check again? 
Um, and we were looking at the blood pressure and it was fine. And I didn't really feel like intervening. Uh, and then the potassium came back and it was 8.9. Um, not exactly sure what was going on. I know, I know there was some acute kidney rejection after the transplant, um, but why it should got so high, I, I didn't really have an explanation. However, this was not VT. This was sinus rhythm with hyperkalemia. This is a sine wave pattern of hyperkalemia. So instead of uh, treating it like VT, uh, we treated hyperkalemia and began with uh, sodium chloride and calcium. Uh, you can see the EKG looks a little more regulation. QRS is still wide. The T-way is still bizarre. And uh, finally, when we got the potassium down to six after glucose and insulin, uh, the T-way is still a little peaked, but um, it's, it's a pretty normal appearing EKG. So sinus rhythm can begin to look like this sine wave if the potassium gets too high, and always keep that in mind. I'm going to add a bonus here. This is a 14-year-old with recurrent exertional syncope. Um, there was sudden death in an uncle and a cousin. Quite concerning family history. Um, had an echo done that was completely normal. And we were asked to look at the electrocardiogram. And in this particular case, this is actually a hard diagnosis to make, given that background. But this is a stone-cold normal electrocardiogram. No abnormalities in repolarization. All the intervals are normal. Everything looks normal. However, if you take this same patient and run them on a treadmill, that's what they do. Sort of bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. So this is catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And you could have been clued into that based on the presenting history. And I call this the silent EKG killer because the baseline electrocardiogram is uh, completely unrevealing that there's something bad going on. So I'm going to stop there and I want to welcome you all to Boston for PD Rhythm 10 and thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>